Um, right, there we are. You can actually hear me now. We've got the microphones on. We're ready to go. Um, the issue of a licensing scheme has already come up this morning. Um, the difficulty of implementing that. Um, so we're going to explore that right now in the next half an hour. Under the heading of raising standards, which is always a good thing to do, and particularly now. Um, Brian Berry is, of course, on my left, Chief Executive of the Federation of Advanced Builders, you've already heard from him. Uh, Paula Higgins, who is the founder and CEO of Homeowners Alliance, there at the end, welcome to you, Paula. And Gary Olson, Director of Create Building and Developments Limited. Right, so we're going to hear um, just briefly from each of them as to what their, uh, so that, that what their pitch is, what their view is on all of this before we enter into questions afterwards and we'd like to hear from you if you are joining us remotely then please do send more questions in um okay uh, brian let's start with you from there thanks so much tanya um so i was really encouraged by the earlier speakers talking about the need for standards and uh, also the discussion about licensing because the federation master builders has been in existence for uh, over 80 years and we are on a journey in terms of raising standards so we've uh, develop our entry criteria, moving away from being a traditional trade body into one that is becoming more professional. And the reason why the FNB has been calling for a licensing scheme is the simple fact that anyone can call themselves a builder. So all of us this afternoon could go out, I know we've got professional builders here, but someone like myself could go out and say, bury builders, and it would be a disaster if I came into your house and started doing it. So that's why, in a nutshell, uh, we need to have some form of licensing or registration for companies in this country, because 32% of homeowners are put off having work done. They don't know who to go to. And also, the damage it causes to our industry, because the reputation of the construction sector it's largely defined by the experience we have in our homes, new kitchen, new bathroom. And who hasn't got some story about something that's gone wrong because of a cowboy builder? That's why we need licensing. And it, although people talk about it in principle, isn't it time we get action? Because it doesn't seem right at a time when post Grenville, with, when we hear about the Building Safety Act later, but in the domestic sector, it is a free-for-all, and consumers are spending tens of thousands of pounds on companies who they may not know will be competent to do the work. And critically, if it goes wrong in terms of consumer redress, who do they go to? Chase the builder that's disappeared and gone across another part of the country, rely on trading standards whose budgets have been cut, or take the legal route and you need deep pockets if you want to employ a lawyer to chase uh, the road trader. So that's why there needs to be a separate licensing body for uh, construction companies, particularly in the domestic and repair maintenance sector. Each company would pay uh, a fee for that. And I think one of the benefits of that, I was talking to one of our members earlier, is actually can we try to rationalize some of the accreditations that building companies have to pay for? Because if we had a single licensing scheme, we could actually look at the entire landscape of standards for uh, building companies and start to actually cut back and make it easier, more streamlined, more transparent, and provide better service to clients. Um, the FNB published a report four years ago, licensed to build, independent by Pi Tate, setting out a model for licensing. It operates in other countries, Australia, America, Germany. It's not new something that actually we've got left behind in this country. So the model already exists. And uh, we are seeing political support across the political spectrum. So last year, the Conservative MP Mark Garnier tabled a private member's bill calling for the licensing of uh, domestic building companies. Um, that didn't attract government support, but they did engage with us in terms of what the next steps might be. And Often, sometimes, it, they, people talk about the ombudsman. Well, I think sometimes there's a danger of the horse having bolted. We need to stop the complaint in the first place. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion today about licensing and to push the need for it, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding 
about licensing, um, particularly when some politicians talk about increased red tape. Actually, this is, would create a bigger market because it would provide assurance to homeowners to have the work done. Thank you very much indeed. I feel that I'm going to be the other side of the argument. I know all three of you have uh, views that are broadly aligned um, with what Brian has just said. Um, Gary, if we can come to you and, and what your view is. Now, one might expect, given your perspective, that your view is that licensing is not a good idea. However... <laughs> However, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd be the obvious person that wouldn't want it. You know, red tape, it's difficult, we shouldn't do it, it makes life difficult for us. Um, but I just don't agree with that. I mean, there's so many challenges to consumers at the moment. You know, picking the right contractor. Are they getting value for the money? Do they get the finished outcome they expect it to get? You know, will their house be damaged? It's all those kind of things. Um, Electricians and heating engineers have been licensed for years. So what they do is a safety matter. You say you don't want someone that's not licensed to come and put your boiler in or someone to wire it out. Well, daily up and down the country, there's bills in the construction industry taking the backs of people's houses. And actually, if your house falls over into your back garden, that's a pretty serious scenario if the person you've appointed in good faith is incompetent. So what a licensing scheme will give, it will give this kind of guarantee, almost, not complete guarantee, but guarantee or assurance of quality that that's not going to happen. And you know, I've been called out to look at projects being carried out by the builders and I have to say to the client, stop, you need to tell these people to stop right now what they're doing because what they're doing is going to kill your building. And every now and again you see on the internet houses falling over because someone hasn't done it properly. Um, so Fergus earlier on said it's all too to court and we shouldn't do it. Um, we should have done it 10 years ago, and now people are like, oh, yeah, okay. If we should have done it 10 years ago, we definitely should do it now. Um, you know, when they brought out health and safety legislation for the construction industry in the early 90s, everybody went, oh, it won't work, it's too much red tape, it's too difficult. And no one can look back now and say that that health and safety legislation wasn't a good idea. How many lives have been saved, and how many lives not badly affected because the industry just needed a kick in the proverbial. To, to make it happen. So, you know, I, I think it is down to government to have have you know, the impetus to do it. You know, maybe the current government we've got doesn't like, you know, regulation, maybe it's a people thing, I don't know. Maybe it just seems we've got too much else in our plate. Let's not do it. But Fergus said earlier that 60% of the construction industry work on domestic homes. That's a huge amount, isn't it? You know, and 90 or percent of construction firms are SMEs. So I don't know what percentage construction is the economy. 10%, 9%? So you do fit in that's on that. It's a huge industry that can just do whatever it wants. And no one is there to stop it. So what's in it for us builders? Well, okay, the decent builders, professional builders, all of a sudden we're not being tarred with the brush of the cowboys. And it also will unlock all the things that were spoken about earlier. Training, you know, encouraging young people to want to join an industry that isn't seen as a bit of a kind of Wild West show. This is short it's by some people now. Improvements in health and safety. If I walk around, look at sites that have got poor health and safety, you think, well, if those sites first come, comes a license and then some overarching thing and your health and safety had to be part of your licensing, you have to demonstrate that competence. There's be less injuries, less injuries and, and worst case deaths. So I think from our perspective, industry, I think we should embrace it. And I think any stakeholder in this process should really be pushing to bring it forward. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, from Gary Olson from create for you or uh, Create Building and Developments Limited. Um, let's now come to Paula Higgins, who's Chief Executive of the Homeowners Alliance. Thank you. Um, We've also done research. So I should say, um, Homeowners Alliance, for those of you who don't know, and actually next week is our 10th year anniversary, so I'm very excited by that, is a group set up to help support homeowners and inspiring homeowners. And we really try to empower homeowners, consumers, encourage them to do their research to protect themselves, and also signpost them to when things go wrong. But unfortunately, they come to our site when usually things are too late. So we very much support working with uh, trade associations, things like that, to try to sort of 
you know, things don't happen in a bad way in the first place. We have done research in the past, and it's very similar to what um, Brian has done, is that um, finding reliable builder is really, really difficult for homeowners, very scared to do so. 79% face obstacles to, to their home improvement plans, they put them off. 55% uh, of them of we surveyed had a negative experience. And one thing I think is huge is actually a third of homeowners pay cash to avoid back that. I'm not saying it's the builders, the homeowners, it's, you know, all. And that is really scary because they have no protection and that's really having the open door to say the rogue traders and that sort of thing. So I think that closing that somehow and sort of reforming that would be a brilliant way to protect homeowners. They think they might be getting a good deal. We know that it's expensive for them. We also have like cold calling. Um, we have, you know, if you start looking at, you know, energy efficiency improvements and all the stuff that's really current now for cost of living, it's all over Google. There's so many ads and things like that. So there's real opportunities for the perhaps the more rogue end to get in touch with these, these homeowners. We just did a piece today or last week on spray foam insulation, um, which is, you know, a, a government measure supported by government, paid for by government, like tax breaks, you know, they're trying to get people trained into using it. And then yet, people who put spray foam insulation in the homes cannot sell their homes at the moment now. So it's ridiculous. So this is really, and this is all the stuff, but we're not going to get homeowners to do these types of improvements. Um, so it doesn't really bode well to refurb our stock. What's interesting, and we we're talking about it earlier, is that it's, it's about taking overall responsibility. So we're used to different licensing. Maybe it's not licensing at builders. Maybe it's maybe even like it's the language, like simplifying the existing licensing schemes for builders because you've got sort of electricians and we're very comfortable with having electricians and plumbers and they're all licensed and the competent persons but it's that overall responsibility so how many times that you might get a, a loft conversion company or you're getting something in and you don't know what you're getting you don't know understand and they might pass it back and say it's somebody else it's the, it's the interconnection i know in i think it's in france where if you get building work done it's it's the overall builder or developer is full responsibility for 10 years down the line or you know whatnot so i think it's about maybe the language that we use um i would worry if it's um you know a bit too much like you know hoops to go through but i think there are probably ways that we can um do it in a way that would be suitable for homeowners and they can see um one brand one marketing scheme and you know don't lose faith in the fact that you know in the world of uh, estate agents it's you know similar <laughs> um and they're not licensed at all uh, they've got a bit of regulation and it is very slowly moving in the right direction managing agents and the other big sort of thing that i think is really encouraging where government has put their head in sand is things like leasehold reform really difficult stuff lots of people really um not wanting this sort of stuff but you know pers perseverance working together um you know it's, it's a long haul really but um perhaps something you know we can can do something to help support the consumers and i completely agree it's not red tape it's about you know protecting consumers having the data encouraging um making them go to the right place to get this building work done which we need to do to meet our net zero targets yeah i mean i think there's unquestionably a very strong case here also in terms of productivity who wants to waste money or have to undo things because they've been done badly and so on. It's a waste of materials, it's a waste of everybody's time, it's a waste of money. However, the sticking point here, surely, Brian, is how one would go about introducing this. What would it mean? How would it be structured? Is there a model for this? Yeah, so we, when we published a report four years ago, then we talked about delivery, how would it work in practice? And there is a plethora of organisations, accreditation schemes, which if you start going into those, you have an open warfare going on. So what you need, actually, is to work with the existing structures. You have got Trustmark, which is government law standards for, for various scheme operators. And we were suggesting Trustmark could be developed into an accreditation body um, to set the standards, but it would need to evolve over time. And it's a model that is uh, very familiar in the, in the building industry. But I think we need to do it as a transition because it's quite a big seismic change um, and we need to make sure that we carry everyone with us because it's really quite a revolution to get every sure. building company license. But in terms of the criteria and, and, and making it not making it too onerous, in a way the checks that the F&B does in, in terms of making sure companies have insurance, checking the quality of work on site, site visit, which is really important. If we had those basic inverted commas checks done to know that the company is bona fide and also critically from the consumer's point of view if the work goes wrong 
there is redress, so they would be able to go to the licensing body uh, to act actually ask for the, um, the case to be looked into. And why not have the choice about warranties and what would work? Um, so that should provide a level of consumer protection. So that gives them the assurance if uh, the work goes wrong, it will be put right. Mm. Okay, um, over to you then, uh, Gary. And this question over, it could be quite jarring, couldn't it? So we're going to introduce it overnight. What are your thoughts about what the, the time frame would be and, and what it would represent this license exactly? I think I agree with Ryan. I think you can't make it too short and sharp because I think you would lose people. I mean, Fergus made that point earlier that you would lose people, you know, people that might be sort of late 50s, early 60s, thinking that's not for me. You know, it's too much of my time in life, I'll probably just stop. And so we, you're talking about an individual, it would be an individual who'd be licensed well, yeah, but for small, the small, the small companies are generally just an ex extension yeah. of one person, aren't they? Right, yeah. You know, so if you've got a guy and he's got five people working for him, if he stops that, that, that business stops. Right. That's that's how the construction industry is tends to put together. It's ninety yeah. percent very fragmented. Very yeah. fragmented. It's small little businesses. So uh -huh. so you know if guy guy A decides it's all too much, you will leave. So I think it's got to be introduced slowly, and people get used to the idea. You know because when the when the CDF thing came in the early nineties, it was very much it's happening now, and that's why it's such a fierce debate. Whereas if you bring it in slowly, people get used to it, and all of a sudden. It's just the more. But you've got to start the journey, haven't you? You've got yeah. to start the process. And I think that's where I'm being a little bit frustrated by it because, you know, it's like, it's all too difficult. It's not worth starting. And I think that's what we need to push for. But you would have to have an ecosystem around this of people getting their license. How would they get their license? Mm. Uh, would there be training around it? Mm. Um, uh, and what would that training be? Would there be some sort of communication with consumers? Um, Paula, consumers would presumably want to have access to what that license means. Um, I don't think so, actually, to be honest. We're not going to get very enthusiastic and look into the details of what a license means. I mean, I think it's, um, unfortunately, they'll, you know, I think the thing about Trustmark, which is a great scheme, but consumers don't know about it. They don't know about it. You know, it's, it's about, where they're looking for their builders, really. So I wonder, my challenge is, is that my worry, and I used to work in a civil servant before I set up homeowners lines, I got so frustrated, which is why I set it up, but um, is my challenge to the industry is like, can you not do some of this yourself? Can you not get the competent person schemes or the, um, you know, the, the different life groups to work together and have an overall badge and to, you know, appreciate, to do more, you know, or what about in saying, maybe the ask to government is, requiring all builders to sign up to a redress scheme or an ombudsman scheme um, and maybe that way so then baby steps um, in the new homes world which um, you know even just having even though it's not statutory but just having that legislation in place has made the bigger developers come together to put something together whether it's right or not so that's my worry is that if you're asking for so much we're not going to make a difference to consumers today well, that's where, I mean, if you look at the FNB as a model where we do the entry criteria, we've got a, a yeah. disputes handling process. If I'm the consumer, I just want to know where do I find a competent builder so I could check online through our find builder service. I need the assurance that they are competent to do the work. And, and if it goes wrong, I know there's redress that yes. actually someone will look into, which is what the FNB does. Yeah, and that's why we don't, you know, I'm not going to sit and look at the qualifications. Yeah. And I think it's like, especially if you're going to get an extension done or a, an integrated piece of work, which most things are, mm -hmm. is that it's not like, oh, that was the electrician's fault or that was the no, tire's no, fault. It's, it's about overall responsibility. So I think exactly right. Um, I think when the practicalities of getting to from here to there is um, where I, I think the challenge is lie. <laughs> so why could it not be extended what it is that you do? Why is that not the starting point? Well, because there are other uh, trade bodies who would probably feel actually what the FNB is the you know, overarching accreditation body, which is why we were suggesting Trustmark because there are other scheme operators who are part of Trustmark and it will give it a degree of independence. But the model that we've already got in terms of membership is should form the basis, I think, of what uh, licensing should be. We don't want to make it too onerous, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that building companies are checked for their competence and uh, and actually, from the consumer's point of view, there's a mechanism to actually put, put things right. And then the insurance policy, which I think would be really helpful if people were signed a contract, made sure that they had the insurance in place if it goes wrong. 
Hmm. And maybe also, just cutting in, like I'm just thinking the parallels with the estate agent world, is that mm -hmm. now there's been lots of obligations on estate agents on making sure they provide upfront information. They haven't been doing it. It's, you know, you can go and sue it, does it? But what's happening now is it's getting onto the portals. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, so looking also at the different portals of where consumers access information, they can see, okay, this builder is advertising, and I can see they've got the insurance in place. I can see they're a member of the ombudsman or a, an accreditation scheme. And that would be that would make a big difference to consumers. Mm. So, Gary, what do you think about this idea of a portal whereby it's it's all on display? Oh, all for it. Yeah. You know, transparency, I think, is really important. You know, I think so many people now, when they when they buy something, you know, you've got a new television, you're going to expect that you're going to have some consumer rights and go out on AO or something for it. You know, um, I sometimes feel that consumers in construction projects have got less rights than if they bought a toaster. Mm -hmm. You know, which sounds ridiculous. You know, but I'm not. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. You know, if, you, if I buy a toaster and it breaks, I'll just take it back to the shop and I'll just be given a new one, and no one will ask me any questions. I think the key thing actually is is the warranty bit. I think when jobs go wrong, the big problem for consumers is building might or fast or run away, mm -hmm. and then what? They run out of money, or they haven't got enough money to complete it. You know, and they're in a terrible state. So some kind of fund or some kind of warranty that has to come with construction projects might be a way to start doing it. You know, ADR, maybe make it compulsory that the companies need to have belong to an ADR organization. So you well, sign it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, so you know you sign a contract, both parties agree to go to ADR if they have a falling out. And then that's the sort of that might be the way to introduce it slowly. The downside of warranties is one of cost because it will just be another cost on the job. It won't be given free by the contractors, it can't be. You know, it's a bit like skips or Prior or timber, so the cost of production of the construction project will go up to two, three, four percent. So consumers have to kind of accept it will cost a bit more money, and that may drive them more to the road trader, you know, the cash people you were talking about earlier. But you know, if we start somewhere and we start to sort of filter it through one step at a time, baby steps, if you like, I think there also has to be an aspect that the industry has to adopt a mentality of we want to be better. Yeah. Right, and, and my experience would be that if you do say to a builder, well, this is how I think that you could have approached this better or communicated better, they're incredibly defensive, actually. They don't like being told, probably even less by a woman, I don't know, uh, you know, that, that maybe they could have done things better, approached things in a different way and so on. So that, that there is a mentality issue, isn't there? Yeah, there is, but there is with some contractors, of course there is. Yeah. You know, there's people with mentality problems across every sector you can For think sure. of. You know, I think a lot of it is, is culture. I think partly is, if you think about if you're an SME builder, you have zero job security. Right. Zero. Because, you know, if the economy <coughs> does that, then people are oh, will do my extension next year. And whereas if you work in most other sectors, you have a reasonable amount of job security. If you're a contractor, you've only got your next job. So that sometimes contributes to a kind of defensive mentality that some contractors have because they're under the caution. Yeah. Right. I, I was on that point about how uh, builders interact with consumers. <laughs> F&B members sign up for a code of conduct. So communication is the issue often between builders and clients. Yeah. And so we recognise that in our code of conduct. And obviously a lot of building companies don't belong to any trade body, so they can do what they want, which is probably might, where you might have had a bad experience. But as an industry, we do need to improve that. That's why the FNB has been on this mission about trying to up standards, and but that should be spread right across the building industry. If we're going to have that, that sea change that is needed. And it will happen, I think, in time, if the government's going to put money into retrofit. We heard mm. the Labour Party committing uh, 60 billion pounds that they will want to make sure that that work is done to a certain standard. So there is the PANS 2035, um, but there might be some form of trust marks developing the license plus. So that would be licensing and higher standards through the back door, but it's done by step rather than actually a, a commitment to improve standards right across the building industry. Yes, please. I'm so sorry, I haven't asked uh, the audience for questions. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Bonnie Martin, Coach of Giants again. Um, apologies if you've already covered this, but I have to step out for a few minutes. Um, but how do you see any sort of licensing structure applying to the heritage um, sector of construction, where um, frequently our members who are trying to um, get work stuff 
find it, again, the same issues with confusion around location, but also things around missing building consent, what needs consent, what doesn't, and where sometimes using different um, materials, for example, not using lines when um, it should be, can cause you know, ongoing issues for years and years. And yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so in particular, this particular sector of building? Yeah, well, I, I think you've got a licensing authority which sets the basic standards about a competent uh, trading company. And in time, I would see that actually there would be ongoing training, CPD, for, for building companies. And that's where I think the specialist builders would actually fit in very nicely. Your members, obviously, is a niche market, so it's sort of very particular about the materials and the craftsmanship that's needed. So we can then start benchmarking. But I think, as I said at the beginning, this is a step change, and we can't do it overnight. The first step would be actually to license all existing building companies, and then raise the standard over time. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I'm going to take the question here in the middle. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, thank please. you. Uh, Jeff Rose, uh, President of YouTube Carpenters. Um, I would just like to basically give my support for Brian's proposing in this discussion in the sense of I've been president of the IFC since 2016 and one of the uh, goals that we've had is about raising the bar, in fact to get away from the white van man mindset in Britain, you know the cash, you'll never see me again mate, I've done the job, that's the way it is. Actually, my view on that is, is that really the best we can do? Yeah. And I think this point about the poor consumer then being faced with, who do I choose, where do I go, what guarantees have I got? You know, as professional, members of the professional body, it's all about raising the bar. And I look at Germany, I look at France, and I look at the way that is structured. And we're a real second division structure here in terms of what consumer can expect. So when Brian said, in Australia, in US, one of other countries, these types of schemes were embedded. I would just encourage the process to say, get it embedded, however slowly you start, but start to get a mindset change. Let's raise the bar. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, raising hands as well as bars. There's a hand here, the gentleman uh, with the green tie. You want yes. me to just shout? Shout. Yeah, okay. Simple question. And I, this is at every level. It's not just a small business. It's those of us who are working uh, in, in major projects. What does the customer think? Because it's the customer who keeps driving prices down and saying, oh, you've got to cut corners. Oh, you've got to value engineer this down. Oh, I, actually, I don't want to pay the VAT. Is there any way we can save that 20%? And all the time, the customer's expectation is that he can get shave a little bit off the job by doing some kind of dodgy deal. It doesn't matter how professional your builders are at any level. Because you're dealing with a customer who's always trying to get a deal. Okay. How do we get over Paula, that? I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's we don't go to John Lewis and try to do a deal with John Lewis for <laughs> buying something there. And I think if it if it is because there's the option, I agree. There's the option of the, the rogue trader or the people who are you know pricing too low. I do wonder, so it's interesting in building regulations. So building regulations, so now people when they're selling their homes, they actually have, and it wasn't like this 20 years ago, that they have to get their planning permissions in place, they've got their building regulations compliance, they've got to get their fences certificates, and that is where it started. So people are now, if they're going to get the windows done, of course, because they know it's starting to go in the mindset, actually, they're going to sell their house, <laughs> um, they're going to have to buy, they're going to have to show these certificates. So perhaps that might be a way in saying, well, actually, okay, I guess I've got my um, my planning permission for my extension, and I've got my compliance certificates, but actually maybe I need to, there might be something there saying, I need to show that it was done by a competent developer or inspector or something like that. So maybe there's something there in terms of the education thing, because I don't think people would buy doing new windows, they'll be looking for that fence up, because they're going to need it when they sell. Yeah, okay, I think it's a good question though. Yes, please, I have it back. I, uh, Chris Fidel from the Marcy Lacey Federation of Defence. Thank you for <laughs> uh, I think what goes hand in hand with what you're saying um, is indemnity insurance, which is a real <coughs> crisis, which um, I'm going to be talking to uh, Brian about in a couple of weeks' time. But for, for Our as top page as, on our website is indemnity insurance, by the way. So yeah. <laughs> For as little as £12, your conveyancing solicitor can get you a policy that indemnifies him or her asking questions about compliance with building regulations. So you're talking fire, structure, all of the important things to do with building regulations. And that can be made to go away by a solicitor selling a policy. So 
that goes hand in hand with licensing because it encourages homeowners to use uh, builders, non VAT registered, etc., etc., because they can get away with it when they sell their property. This goes against what Paula said, which is ask for the competency certificate from a, a competent person scheme, which is really important. So I think the two need to be addressed hand in hand because that's still in a really big hole in the system that needs to be uh, countered. There, uh, there's an unquestionably adjust, an adjustment for the consumer, though, isn't there? Yes, Peter, with the man with the <clears throat> Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Peter. I own AS Homes and Destruction. Um, so as a small builder, I think most people here don't disagree that licensing is needed and I think most people agree with what every one of you have said there but the question is how to launch this successful scheme and how do you do that when um, there doesn't appear to be desire from governments either local or central and you have uh, Fergus there this morning and Bill Esterston who don't really have the desire for it and I'm sure there's hundreds more like him within government so if it doesn't come from government how on earth are we going to put our licensing scheme to what is almost a million small builders. Okay, lack of impetus from government. Brian? Yeah, I mean, that's a challenge, with, particularly with the current government, because of their philosophy of uh, no, no more red tape or uh, government intervention. But um, we heard that Bill talked about 19 million homes. We will need to have competent tradespeople to do that and to, and to deliver. You're going to get the, the financial institutions, if they're lending money, they're going to have to have some assurance that actually the work's done to a certain level and I think this drive to get homes up to the EPC will be the motivator, will be the catalyst for actually driving up standards. So even if government itself doesn't say we're, if we're going to introduce a licensing scheme, it will happen because 28 million homes need to be retrofitted if they're going to be fit for purpose by 2050. Okay, I'm just going to take one more question and bear with us, leave it. Yes, please. This Sorry, gentleman no, front, no. yes. Yeah. Okay, maybe just one question after the other. Please make them a question. Please make it short. Yes. Me or him? Yes, you go first. <laughs> yeah. Well, we keep talking. We've got to be talking about practical things. Everything is like high level, but I don't think it's going to work. Unless the builder, the guy who is on site, does have a license, the company will change. He would move to another company. He's not going to be skilled at all. So he's going to have the license. I'm not going to have it. He's going to move from mine to his. What that's going to solve? Nothing. Okay, yes, you're right, of course, it's very fluid. Yes, and this gentleman here, please, yeah. Yeah, um, it's just that Chris Carr, a housing developer, it's just to say we're missing a bit there, and Gary took so much respect. The, a, tr uh, a builder in Europe has got far more respect than a builder in the UK. Mm. And while we're trying to get young people to join our industry, and their parents don't see the, the validity of, of being a builder, they think it's a last, it's a, a, a last yeah. resort yeah. occupation. Right. So if we have the respect of being a licensed builder, will encourage more young people to join the industry. Okay, yeah. That's a statement rather than a question. <laughs> um, um, what about this, what about this um, issue about the fact that we do see builders reinventing themselves, changing companies, all of that sort of thing, either uh, Gary or Brian or, or anybody well, else? Well, it's, it's just too easy, which is why I think you know, the licensing would really help address that problem. And if it does, but we don't have a licensing scheme, you'll get the financial institutions wanting to make sure that the building company So it's going to be thinking worse to an individual rather than a company then? Well, I think a company would be a great start because if you're trying to uh, credit each individual, that's an even bigger task. All right. Yeah, but something. I don't work on site. If you like, if you can license me, I can go and get all the certificates, but half of them don't speak even English. Mm -hmm. How does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I'm a foreigner. Mm -hmm. I can tell but you. Responsibility is <laughs> with you yeah. and yeah. you run the company. Yeah, right. yeah it is. I'll go bust. He's gonna move to him. He's gonna go bust. I don't see any logic right. behind it. <laughs> right, well, let's just say it's a poor question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there we see that. Thank you very Don't much indeed to our panelists. So we established that the introduction of a license would be certainly a fairly bumpy process, but cited as an example there uh, by Gary was the Building Safety Act of 2022. I think it was actually before he was talking about. Let's get an overview of what this new building act means for small builders from Gavin Hocom, who is Senior Associate at Brown Jacobson. <coughs> <clears throat> if 
by the way, now is the best time because recession is coming. So we can introduce anything we want. They're going to leave, new going to come. There's going to be plenty of people without work. So I don't think it's a problem. <laughs> More radical. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, moving on. <laughs> Not so positively. Um, some six months then following its enactment, the words Building Safety Act and success have rarely been used in the same sentence. The uh, criticism is perhaps justified. Uh, the Act is only partially in force, with no definite time scale for its full implementation. There are um, extensive provisions, some of which are in force, which remain to be uh, developed and finalized through uh, further legislation, <coughs> which has yet to be drafted. This means that for the legal sector, let alone for builders and others in the industry, it's simply not possible to conclusively determine the scope and seriousness of the risks presented by the Act. In the next 15 minutes, my aim is to highlight the key issues which arise under the Act, um, with which the majority of FMB members will need to be concerned, and to share some brief thoughts as to how members can begin to plan for success in the new uh, regulatory landscape. The Act introduces extensive and wide-ranging changes to the regulation of the construction sector. It is, of course, as Brian mentioned, a response to the cladding and fire safety issues which are prevalent uh, in the property sector and which have long needed to be resolved. Consequently, there is an emphasis in the Act on fire safety and higher risk buildings, which currently are defined as buildings over 18 metres in height and containing at least seven storeys. Depending on the part of the Act which is applicable, that definition may be further limited to those properties including two or more dwellings, care homes and hospitals. That definition is expected to change and uh, further legislation is currently under consultation, which will likely mean that the height threshold is reduced. The emphasis, though, on fire safety and higher risk buildings means that there's a common misconception that the Act will only impact on those who are involved in the design, construction and ownership of higher risk buildings or the carrying out of cladding works. In fact, the Act will impact on anyone who has employed, is employing, or will employ others uh, to carry out building works to commercial or residential property, be that new build, redevelopment, or refurbishment. It will impact building contractors and tradespeople, whether sole traders, SMEs or PLCs, construction professionals such as architects and surveyors, construction product manufacturers and suppliers, as well as the owners and occupiers of these higher risk buildings. This means that if you are in any way involved in the construction sector, you need to understand how the, the act impacts you now and how it may impact you in the future. For the purposes of this brief talk, I've selected five of the key provisions with the Act, within the Act which are likely to impact on FNB uh, members. Firstly, the Act has introduced a building safety regulator, a division of HSE, 
which will oversee the performance and safety of all buildings. The regulator will act as the building control authority for higher risk buildings. Meanwhile, building authority, uh, uh, building control approvers, which we formerly known as uh, approved inspectors, will continue to carry out building control uh, functions in relation to all other property. The regulator, however, will have extensive enforcement powers to prosecute non-compliance with the building regs. The time limit for um, levying fines for non-compliance has been removed. The uh, time limit for the giving of a notice to a property owner to alter or remove non-compliant work has been increased from one year to 10 years. During the carrying out of works, the regulator um, can give notices requiring non-compliant work to be remedied by a certain date and to stop all work on site until the non-compliance is resolved. A failure to comply with those notices is a criminal offence, which could result in imprisonment or an unlimited fine. If the offence is committed by a company, then in certain circumstances, the Act allows the personal prosecution of directors, managers, and similar officers of the company or, as the case may be, limited liability partnership. The risk of personal prosecution for these and other offences under the Act means builders and directors and managers of building companies need to exercise a greater personal oversight for the carrying out and management of works to ensure not only compliance with the building regs, but also with any notices that may be issued by the regulator from time to time. The Act also includes provisions to bring Section 38 of the Building Act 1984 into force. It is not currently in force, despite having existed within this piece of legislation since it was originally enacted. Um, and it is unclear when, or even if, it will be brought into force. In principle, though, Section 38 will give private persons the right to claim a financial remedy from uh, builders, construction professionals, and trades people where work to any building, whether commercial or residential, is non-compliant with the building rates. Currently, a claim could be brought under any corresponding contract for the works if the contract includes an actual or inferred requirement that the work comply with the building rates. Unlike a contractual claim, however, Section 38 will apply to any works carried out um, which are required to comply with the building regs, irrespective of the contract terms that may exist between the parties involved, and irrespective of the type of work which is being carried out. Quite simply, if there is non-compliance <coughs> with the building regulations, there will be a claim. It will be no defence to um, rely on an issue with the specification of the works. It will be no defence even to rely on the fact that the works might have been inspected and signed off by the building control approver. The scope of Section 38 does not limit the nature of the financial remedy which can be sought. And so it will not be limited to simply the cost 
of remedy. It could extend beyond that to other, we say, consequential losses which may have been suffered by the employer or property owner. Most worryingly, perhaps, a claim under Section 38 will be able to be brought within 15 years of completion of the non-compliant work. This will, though, operate only prospectively, meaning that it will only apply uh, to works which are completed after section is brought into force. We expect it is a question of when, not if, section 38 is brought into force, which means there is a greater need than ever for members to implement reliable systems for not only ensuring but also evidencing compliance with the building regulations. The ease of obtaining photo and video records during the life cycle of the project means there's no excuse for not um, collating and maintaining a catalogue of evidence. It may, after all, be required up to 15 years post-completion. Previously, the Defective Premises Act 1972 was only relevant where work was carried out in relation to the provision of a dwelling, which meant the construction or conversion of a property so as to form a new dwelling. The Act has removed this limitation and imposes a new duty under the 1972 Act to, on uh, anyone <coughs> carrying out work in relation to a dwelling to ensure that the work is carried out uh, in a workmanlike or 